my time at Berkeley began as a student um, and taking a class, a CE 130 class from Professor Popoff, uh, who used to talk about uh, the work he did in the lab all the time, and it, it, it intrigued me, and I went up to him one day and I asked him if, uh, if I could help him work in the lab, do anything, and, and he said yes, and he put me to work. <laughs> um, and this, this was in, uh, this was uh, early 70s, about 72, 3, uh, and I later uh, 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 re worked uh, really for Patero and put a lot of time in on the U.S.-Japan research projects there, uh, researching the um, uh, scaled, uh, scaled down uh, behavior of materials, reinforced concrete, you know, trying to scale that down to one-fifth scale and get it to look like, you know, the same uh, stress-strain curve as a full scale. Uh, it was not easy. It was very tedious trying to, uh, trying to do that and affect that. Um, I didn't actually get to the shake table until about 1982, uh, which was uh, just about the time we were getting ready to test uh, the, those uh, U.S.-Japan models. Uh, and when I got to the table, um, it was not in good shape. It, was, it had been around for about 10 years. Uh, equipment was old. Parts were failing. Uh, ser there was a bad servo valve. Um, the electronics were just uh, um, something to behold. There were no there were no manuals for this because this was a a, a, a project that was developed. Um, you know, as they went, you had what I had uh, when I pulled out a board, a circuit board from the control system. There were wires jumped all over the place uh, on this. This was not just a nice, clean printed circuit. You know, it had been modified. Uh, all over the place, and I could scramble around and would find notes from people who had done this work, and you know this worked and this didn't work, and so on. Um, so uh, my engineering uh, background was mechanical engineering, and I found that uh, my classes in electronics really came in handy at that point. Um, so we got I got to the shake table, and it was. Uh, kind of non-functional, in a non-functional state, um, and I had to learn very quickly a lot about it. Um, Dixon Ray has been mentioned a number of times here. Dixon Ray was one of the early, real hands-on developers of the shake table, and the whole, not just the table, but the, uh, all the electronics, the computer system, uh, the data storage, all of that stuff, and he was a professor uh, at the time down in L.A., and he was gracious enough to come up and, and help me with, uh, get familiar with some of those things. Um, to give you an idea about how old it was, the backup system for the computer, it was a, called a mini computer at the time. It was a Nova system. And uh, the, back, the backup of that was a, a printed, it was a punch tape. Right? So if, if, if you had a failure and you needed to reload <laughs> <laughs> this computer system, you had to bring out these rolls of punch tape, which were old even then. Um, so it, it was it was a it was a lot of work to get up to speed. I also went back to MTS, spent some time uh, talking with the engineers back there, um, who were very interested in reengaging with with Berkeley because um, it, you know how the funding is here. You uh, once they had developed the table, Berkeley was saying, okay, you guys can go away now because we don't want to spend any more money. And so they, they were feeling a little left out and they were very anxious to, to get re-engaged with uh, Berkeley. So they were very, very helpful. Um, the, the shake table was uh, a, a collaborative effort really between Berkeley and MTS. Uh, MTS had, had already, there was a table, a shake, a shake table developed prior to the Berkeley table in Cyril, uh, Illinois, by the, uh, for the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And their, their interest was more uh, for shock testing, uh, as you can imagine, explosions and things like that. Uh, and it was, not, it was not about seismic testing. But uh, the Berkeley table was the first earthquake simulator ever was, and, uh, 
it was when they when they got rejected for the big 100 by 100 foot scale uh, size table and had to come up with this I believe it was a third scale um, it the, the cost dropped enormously because w with that scaling down your your displacements your velocities come way down and the huge amount of oil you need to make that happen you know reduces so your your pumps everything just everything gets scaled down and it was a big big cost savings the only thing that goes up uh, is the frequency demand because you know the scaling factor um, but that was not a problem because uh, the big uh, operating, uh, the, the equipment there was the servo valve that really made it all work. And servo valves had been developed during World War II and, and they were uh, very, very high performance, even back then, very, very high performance uh, uh, piece of equipment. So, uh, but still everything was very much analog back then. The, the, there was a, digital was very, very primitive, but there was a computer. Uh, it was slow. We, uh, we had a Fortran compiler on the computer, uh, and we could calculate uh, FFTs and response spectrums. But when you wanted to calculate a response spectrum, you put it in just about when you were getting ready to go home, you put in the, <laughs> the command, <laughs> you hit the return button, and the next morning you came in and there was a piece of paper <laughs> with the response spectrum. So we didn't do it a lot, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> it was slow. Yeah, it was really slow. When the, uh, the it was uh, the people, the Penzine, Clough, Dixon Ray, Bocamp, uh, these guys were all participated in the, in the basic design of the, uh, of the foundation of the shake table and the table itself. The table itself weighs about 100,000 pounds, heavily, heavily reinforced concrete, post tension. Um, and, you know, that was all, all Berkeley, you know, MTS, uh, they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't do that. Um, and, but what MTS really came up with, their big contribution was called a degree of freedom uh, system. And this is an algorithm for being, controlling multiple actuators. Uh, and what it did is, uh, it, is, it, it, um, is it would proportion um, the commands to each actuator uh, according to, to its state within the six degree of freedom system um, and they uh, it was quite a it was quite a a, a, a nifty algorithm um, not intuitive actually and people first you showed that to people and they kind of oh that's not going to work <laughs> but it did it works uh, it worked very well uh, they MTS actually patented the idea of the degree of freedom control and uh, that's what they used to to uh, design around uh, design the table and the actuators. Uh, at the, the at the time, the the table is designed to uh, to move vertically and in one horizontal direction only. Um, and it was decisions were made uh, about you know what was cost effective, what was really important, what was not important, and so on. Uh, there was there was a need to do some further cost cutting on the development. Um, and so they decided to drop one of the horizontal actuators. So we were, it went from the four, who was the concept, and went, went down to three actuators. Well, because the way the table, uh, the table itself is designed, the geometry, this created an eccentric uh, situation with the three actuators. And that really, uh, that was a problem because it, did not work at all well with the degree of freedom concept. So they had to do, uh, what they had to do was hardwire in a, uh, a proportion, a command for, uh, force distribution for the three actuators, which then uh, really r ruined the, the degree of freedom concept when it came to controlling the, uh, the twist, uh, the rotation about the vertical uh, of the table. So there was, essentially no uh, external control for the twist. You just got what you got, uh, and hopefully it wasn't too bad. Um, these were the kinds of things I had to learn about going through the notes 
and <laughs> deciphering the, the circuits that, that I saw and talking with the engineers uh, at MTS and so on. Um, the, uh, the second thing that they discovered with the shake table, the uh, second problem they ran across, was uh, the vertical system. They had, they had this air pressure so you could float this entire table, 100,000 pounds plus another 100,000 pounds model, you know, 200, 250,000 pounds just, just with a few PSI, I think about four PSI. And so they thought, well, what's, you know, the vertical components, uh, typically two-thirds of horizontal component, and came up, sized the actuators for that, and, you know, so we can do that. What they overlooked was the overturning moment that is generated with the horizontal motion. And they quickly discovered that the vertical actuators were, were way over, uh, overtaken with the, with the overturning moment. So what to do? They had to, they had to fix this problem, and it was Joe Penzine came up with a design, uh, which uh, we then called uh, passive stabilizers. And these were four actuators in the far corners of the table that were cross-coupled hydraulically. No electronics, no control. It's, it's just a, a passive system uh, so that uh, the table could rise and fall without any hindrance, but it could not rotate, so it restrained rotation. It was cheap, and it worked quite well, and MTS hated it. They just, because uh, it really, now they've really uh, screwed with the, the, the DOF system, uh, and they just didn't like that at all. Uh, but it worked, and they did a lot of testing. Like I say, it went on for, and it wasn't until um, uh, the, the six DOF upgrade that we did, uh, which uh, it really came in around 95, uh, that we fixed all these problems. Of course, we, we have now completely uh, um, uh, concentric uh, actuators, uh, the geometry. Um, MTS learned another lesson about that, uh, actually, um, in, uh, much later on uh, when they were building the, the system in Buffalo. They, uh, they had, uh, it was, I don't remember the details of it, but they had, they had one on their table, they had some eccentricity, and the guys uh, at MTS said, oh, well, we can, we can program that, we can, you know, we can do that, and it wasn't, it wasn't effective. They had, to, they had to, to tear it out and rebuild it to make it more concentric, because it was a, a significant advantage. You know, you can have the control system is good to a point, but you need all the advantages you can get. And, and working with the eccentric system uh, was just not good at all. Um, so out of, the, uh, out of my time learning and studying how the, all these things worked and the, and the history and you know, talking with people, uh, uh, at the time, this was still in the, uh, in the 80s, um, digital electronics had not advanced quickly enough, it, it, it was just, they were just not fast enough to control a servo valve. Um, you needed an update rate of about 500 times a second to, to adequately control the servo valve digitally, and, and they, just, they just, you know, they weren't there yet with the digital electronics. But uh, through the early 90s, uh, the, the developments began to, uh, to happen uh, with the digital electronics, they were getting faster and faster, and they were just starting. You know, in the by the 90s, they were just starting to be able to uh, control, uh, do to do digital control on the servo valves. But um, things were changing so fast that that designs were becoming were obsolete almost about as fast as it could be built and, and developed. Um, eventually, uh, you know, eventually the 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 electronics advanced to the point where uh, things were pretty much off the shelf, and, and it wasn't so much a uh, a big entrepreneurial effort to <laughs> to put together a digital system. But in the meantime, um, we had I had learned enough to be able to. Uh, we did a lot of um, analog uh, computers. I, I designed and built uh, analog uh, control systems to to help test the uh, surplus images, uh, 
beam column connections, shear walls, and the bearings the, uh, uh, that we have, the, some of the bearing tests, the bearing test machine uh, you had there used uh, um, a DOF uh, analog control to, to run that. Um, so we got a lot of use out of it, and it, uh, it really, I think, kept Berkeley on the forefront uh, of things all that time. We were always on the edge, you know, always, uh, always uh, uh, the technically uh, on the edge of things. And, and I can remember, oh, almost every week there would be a tour bus of Japanese or Chinese or people from Europe all over the, coming in, what's new going? What's going on? What's, what's new, you know? Um, so that was very exciting times, um, and I think uh, I think that's about a wrap. Thank uh, you, Bob.